Um, well, we're going to go ahead and turn it over to you both, uh, Noah and John. Thank you both for, uh, for, for joining us here. Uh, both coming to us from Strauss Friedberg, as you see, and uh, with a very strong software development backgrounds. And especially when we look to, uh, you know, these really hard problems of addressing an exponentially increasing volume of data that comes across in our logs, as well as many different formats. Uh, sometimes the old standbys when it comes to the, not necessarily just the tool grep, but the approach that has become known as grepping. Um, I'm eager to see what uh, what all you're bringing to, uh, bring to the fight in the modern age of searching logs. So glad to have you on board with us and I will turn it over to you both. All righty. Howdy everybody. And uh, uh, welcome to uh, grep and logs. We've got a lot to get through, so we're just gonna get started. Um, so just to go through our agenda real quick before we do introductions, uh, we're gonna talk about some guiding principles. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, sort of these new fields of data engineering and data science. We're going to go back in time to the 1970s and talk about core Unix command line tools. We're going to talk about how to approach um, structured data like CSV and JSON. Then we're going to talk about my uh, favorite doc topic, which is performance. Uh, we'll talk about a tool that we have um, that's open source called LightGrep. And then we'll talk about how the cloud uh, affects all of this. So uh, introductions, my name is John Stewart. Uh, as Corey Altide once said, uh, not the one you miss, the other one. Um, and uh, I uh, do forensic software development. I've been doing it for 18 years now, uh, before at uh, Guidance Software on NCASE. And then I had my own company, Lightbox Technologies. Straws Friedberg acquired that in 2015. And I've been with Straws for the past uh, uh, six years. Um, Noah? My name is Noah Rubin. Nice to meet you all. I'm newer on the scene than John. I'm a director in our Chicago lab. I head up our Chicago lab, which is where John and I are standing right now. Um, and before coming to Straws, I was a software engineer and a data scientist at some startups and doing some natural language processing at a tech company in China. I no longer have the computer I was using when I was in China. Um, and I am I am very passionate about automating stuff because I'm lazy and scaling up how we do forensics. So when Noah's uh, not doing client work, which is, you know, for about three hours out of every week, uh, he likes to show me up by writing new tools himself. So he really keeps the pressure on me. Um, so our guiding principles uh, really sort of like the core here is that you want to go back. We want to use those old time uh, Unix command line tools for processing logs, because that approach allows you uh, to, to get a good combination of performance while still coping with all the variance that each set, law, set of log data comes to you. So you want tools that um, our command line can be scripted out uh, so you can create complex pipelines. You want simple tools that do a single task well and then you want to compose those tools by putting them together like they're Legos. Um, you want to make sure that you are paying attention to performance so that you don't miss your deadlines, so that you don't, uh, when you get a large log data set, that you don't uh, have your tools break on you and, and miss your deadlines and, and have unhappy clients. Um, and then finally, uh, and this is sort of like the new thing to talk about is that forensics is really sort of like uh, data engineering and data science, and we should approach it as such. So I'm going to try and convince you that that is true, um, because I don't often hear people talk about data science and forensics together, but I, I promise you that they are the same thing. Forensics is data engineering and data science. So to define some terms quickly, what is data engineering? It is shaping data into a usable state so that you can use it to do data science, which is interpreting data to extract actionable insights. And for anyone that works DFIR, if those don't sound like what you do every day, then I'm not really sure what you're doing. Um, so the, the high level process for data engineering and data science is follows. You get some raw data set, could be a set of logs from a client, could be from insert, uh, some internal tooling, whatever it is. Uh, ideally, you define a set of questions you wanna answer about those data. And from the questions that you wanna answer, you can determine what are the necessary steps I need to do to answer those questions, both from an engineering side and from an analysis side. 
then you actually do the data engineering, shape the data into the state that you need it, um, and then you do your analysis, and then rinse and repeat. So here's a nice high-level diagram of what this should look like, in our opinion. You get your data, you define your question set, engineer it. Really important step is generating intermediate data sets, which I'll get into why that's important on the next slide. Um, I, what I like to do is do some triage analysis, like I'm gonna pull out my event logs, process them quick, and just see if I can get some quick wins. You do your in-depth stuff, communicate the stuff to the client or internal stakeholders, rinse and repeat. This is what I see a lot of people doing, not just elsewhere, but sometimes at straws too. Uh, this is important for everybody, is you'll get some raw data set. Some people will just grep for IOCs and that's it. Just go straight to communicating that and that's it. Sometimes a client will say, hey, I have this one very specific question. So you take your raw data, you process it to answer that one very specific question. And then counsel come back, comes back and is like, oh, well, actually I have this other kind of related question, but it's a little bit different. And you realize, shoot, I missed like a couple fields in my original processing that I actually needed for this other question. So then you go back and you reprocess the data. You gotta wait three hours for that to be done. I've seen people just like popping open sublime text and manually reviewing JSON. Some people are like, you know what? I don't even want to deal with this command line stuff. I'm just going to throw it in Splunker Elk and do it there. Um, it's, it's a hodgepodge. And so here are the key takeaways that uh, I just want to impart on everybody. One, the quicker you do data engineering, the quicker you can start doing your analysis. Um, Another thing is define your question set to the best of your ability before you shape your data, because then you don't have to spend hours reprocessing stuff. Uh, never mutate the original data set, always generate intermediate data sets from your transformations, um, and, and it will save everybody a lot of time. One final thing I want to talk about there, uh, Noah, I'm sorry to barge in on you yeah. uh, contemporaneously, but um, the with data engineering and that approach, while your log data might change from investigation to investigation to investigation, the data engineering approach allows you to do some preparation beforehand when you're not in the thick of it. And so by, you know, when you have a new uh, case come in with a new set of logs, you can say, let me adapt those logs to my existing process. And then I have all this existing infrastructure that I've built up that lets me get through things quickly. And it allows you to actually take a smarter approach, um, but not have to do it just in the moment of the investigation. So let's talk about uh, these core Unix command line tools. Uh, I'm guessing that there are two groups of people uh, right now. There are those who know these com Unix command line tools, and they're, they're really afraid that we're going to go into depth on them. Uh, uh, to, to that group of people, I'd say, just be patient. We will, we will get through this very briefly. Um, and I'm imagining the second group uh, of you don't have much experience at all with these uh, command line tools. And I don't want to go through those tools in depth. We don't have the time right now. But I really urge you to take a moment and, and learn these tools. And here's the set of tools that we think are, uh, these are your daily drivers that will allow you, if, if, if you learn these tools, you will be extraordinarily productive. It's only like less than a dozen, right? And, and you'll be able to cope with anything that comes your way in a performant way. Um, some of them have to deal, do with uh, uh, dealing with the input and just transforming the input. Some of them actually have to do with, with processing the data like grep and cut and sort and unique. Um, SED is an interesting tool. It's not so easy to use, but you could, there are lots of examples online that you can just copy and paste from. That's, that's what I do. Uh, and SED really allows you to do um, search and replace at scale just right on the, from the command line. Um, the final one I have to confess uh, is AUK. And AUK is its own programming language. Um, and I don't know it very well. I can't use it very well. Uh, so that's something that I need to bone up on more myself. But I am in awe of those who can use AUK well. If you know AUK, you can do anything in about five lines of code. Um, and I think it might be the secret to how Pomeranz is success, maybe, uh, or at least one of them. So uh, 
we're going to uh, skip on now to talk about um, processing structured data. But we do have a lot of links in the slide deck and some other uh, uh, slides about all of those core command line tools. Uh, I will say we have one we have one um, example of an aux script in the appendix slides where you can convert uh, MySQL output to SQLite compatible output, and that has helped me in a number of cases. It's a ridiculous aux script, but if you want to see like how far you can take it, you can take a look at that script. Um, okay, so we're going to talk about two types of structured data that I'm pretty sure everybody here deals with from time to time. One is CSV data, or more generally, tabular data. There's one specific toolkit that I really like to use. It's called CSV Kit, open source, written in Python, available on GitHub. They have documentation as well on Read the Docs. Um, and it's a collection of command line tools. Uh, there are more than just the ones that, um, mentioned here, but these are like the core set of tools that I like to use from CSV Kit. So one is CSV Clean. That's a really quick way just to see, hey, does my tabular data, uh, is there like a uniform set of columns for every row? That's a, that's a pretty basic one because sometimes you get stuff that's from clients that's messy, super messy. So you just wanna see, is it clean enough for me to start doing analysis or do I need to do some data engineering to clean it up? Uh, CSV format's a simple one. If you get some that's like some random encoding, uh, CSV format will encode it and uh, use the proper uh, field delimiters and quotations, which is really nice. CSV look, uh, have you ever like catted a CSV file to standard out and just tried to look through the rows? It's very difficult and I find myself squinting at it. If you look, if you use CSV look, it just formats it really nicely and it's, it's easier to look at. CSV stat, if you want to get basic descriptive statistics for a set of columns in a CSV, super easy tool. CSV cut is a lot like the Unix cut tool, but it handles CSV data better. And there are some intricacies there that it just, you don't have to deal with them. Uh, CSV join is a, is a really useful tool. If you have two CSVs that have some sort of column that you can join them together with, you just run CSV join and you can get a join data set, super easy. Um, so we have some examples in here. I'm not gonna play this whole thing because it's too long, but obviously you can take a look at the slides after. So this shows a good workflow for using the tools I just talked about, using CSV clean to see if your data sets are clean. And if they're not, creating a copy, at a cleaned version of them so that you can do your analysis. You can use CSV, CSV stat, look at the headers, just do some exploratory analysis on it. This is an example of using CSV look. You can see it's much easier to look at that than just raw CSV data. Um, and then I use CSV join to actually join two CSVs together on an ID column. Uh, we have a repo, which we'll talk about later, but we have a repo associated with uh, this talk up on the Strauss Freebird GitHub org. All of the data sets and examples are up on that repo. You can take a look at them after. The next is JSON data. I love that meme, it's absolutely fantastic. Uh, JSON data we see all the time, O365 BEC type investigations. We see them in AWS with CloudTrail logs all the time. And JQ is probably the best tool for command line JSON processing. It's written in C, it's super fast, and it can do pretty much anything you can think of with JSON input. Uh, so this is an example of CloudTrail logs. For those of you that don't use AWS as much, it's essentially the audit trail uh, for um, uh, admin level actions in AWS. And then it can also do some S3 access logging as well. Uh, the format for CloudTrail logs is their gzipped JSON data, and each log file contains one or more records. So what we show in this example is you can unzip the logs, do some exploratory analysis on what the JSON structure is, all using JQ, all from the command line. And then you can actually take each record, generate some tabular data in CSV, because dealing with JSON can be a pain, um, and then run some descriptive statistics on the CSV data. So my favorite topic, performance. Um, all the tools that we've talked about so far will make you productive and being productive is the best performance win. Uh, but there are some times when the client calls you up on Friday afternoon and says, I've got 20 terabytes of logs you've never seen before, and I need your preliminary analysis done by uh, Monday morning, and no one else will take the case, but I know that you will, right? So those times you need 
the NOS button to go really fast. Um, so here are some tools that will help you do that. Uh, the most important of which is GNU Parallel. We'll talk about that a little bit later in a, another slide. Um, Noah showed you all sorts of fantastic things that can be done with CSV Kit. CSV Kit is great. You should learn it. Um, but CSV Kit is written in Python, and Python is slow. So CSV Kit is not as fast as it could possibly be. There's a new tool called XSV. It's written in Rust, has a lot of functionality itself, a little different than CSV Kit. Um, but programs that are written in Rust are fast. So that will uh, help you get through loads and loads and loads of CSV if that's, if that's the kind of data that you're working with. Um, for those of you who uh, use Python for scripting, working with JSON data in Python is amazing. It's, it's awesome, it's so easy, right? You just like parse the string, boom, it's a dict, there you go, you're off to the races in Python. Problem is Python is slow. And so processing JSON in Python is slow. Um, there is a Rust library for parsing JSON called ORJSON. And although it's written in Rust, it is designed for easy usage in Python. You can just pip install it and import it. It is a drop-in replacement for the standard library module. I've, there is the uh, absolute best thing to use because there's, there are a few things in life that can make your Python scripts five times faster, but ORJSON can, and it has for us, and it's just, just been fantastic. Uh, you should just always use it by default for everything. Um, for those of you who've got a little more tech uh, skill with, with being able to use C or C++ and some compilers, even if just a little bit, and if you need to go really fast, if you need that 900 horsepower charger, um, there's a tool, there's a library called SIMDJSON. SIMDJSON uses the SSE and AVX vector instructions uh, on Intel CPUs to highly accelerate uh, uh, JSON parsing. And it is the fastest JSON parser out there. It's not even close, it's twice as fast as the next fastest. Um, and it can process gigabytes of JSON a minute. So um, some performance principles to keep in mind. The most important one is procedural. And that is just to start to benchmark, however roughly, whatever your throughput is on your pipeline as you're processing data. I find a lot of people don't do this, and then they get close to the deadline of when they've got to make it deliverable, and they don't know when it's going to be done, and they start calling me, and by that point, there's nothing I can do. If you uh, are able to estimate what your rough throughput bandwidth is for your whole pri uh, pipeline, you'll be able to extrapolate from that to get a sense of when you'll be finished processing. And if it's tight, or if you're going to overshoot it, you can do that, you know, if you've done that early on, you can adjust your approach or set client expectations appropriately, right? You can batch things up into sets and get at least a few batches done as opposed to having being 0% done when your, your, your deadline comes. Um, the second most important thing uh, with performance these days is of course to make use of all the cores that you have on your system. Um, GNU Parallel is the key to doing that because it will launch um, a command for each set of uh, file paths that it has as input and can you, and it can saturate your cores. We'll show you a demo of that in just a moment. Um, finally, when it comes to NVMe, or finally, when it comes to IO, you got to use NVMe. There is no excuse in 2021 for not using NVMe to its fullest. It is absolutely the best money you can buy, the cheapest money you can buy to accelerate your forensic processing. NVMe drives are just amazing. Don't bother around with spinning rust ever. Don't even bother with SATA SSD drives because SATA is actually the bottleneck. The drive itself can go way fast. It's the same hardware as, in, as this in the NVMe, but the protocol is so slow. It can't, set, it can't fully utilize the, the underlying hardware. So use NVMe. Finally, if your processing is going to produce a lot of output, you should consider using a second I.O. device that's dedicated for grabbing that output. And that way you avoid uh, mixed I.O. So you can read from one device right to the other. They're go both going to perform as fast as they possibly can then. Uh, even if you put, even NVMe suffers under mixed I.O. 
Okay, so this is an example of the kind of throughput that you can get using GNU Parallel. Um, so you can see on the bottom, we have HTOP running, showing you how many cores. We have eight logical cores on this machine. It's not a great machine. I'll just say that up front so that you can do much better than this example. We have five and a half megs of compressed AWS CloudTrail log data. And what we've done is written a script that operates on a single file to unzip the file and then run JQ on the JSON data to extract individual CSV records. So what you can see me typing here is, uh, I'm gonna use the find command to list all of the .gz, which are the gzipped uh, CloudTrail logs. And then I'm going to pipe them to GNU Parallel. I'm using the jobs um, command line switch to schedule essentially five files to be processed on each core. And I'm gonna run the script on each one. So you'll see in a second on the bottom, our CPU utilization is going to spike once I hit enter. Now it spikes. There we go. Right, and that's the difference between using a single core to sequentially process all your files and actually using the computing power that you have um, at your fingertips. Yeah, and eight cores is one thing, right? But uh, you know there are a lot of tools out there that are eight cores. But you probably have more than eight cores these days. You might have twenty. You might have thirty on the servers. You might have sixty-four cores. And so um, there aren't any other tools out there other than this kind of approach that can really saturate. 64 cores at once. And it's awesome when you can be able to do that. So uh, LightGrip. LightGrip is a, a search tool I wrote. I started writing it in, uh, it's over like 11 years ago now, the spring of 2010. Um, had I known how long it was going to take me to finish, I never would have started. Uh, I got it uh, kind of running. It was really fast and it was like, three times faster in end case, and I made some changes, it was 10 times faster in end case. Uh, and then I finally came up with like a really good set of uh, QA tests, and it took me two years to pass those QA tests because it's, it's such a hard problem. Uh, and that's why no one has really ever <laughs> before solved the multi-pattern grep problem. Um, so we released it as, op uh, we released it as an add-on product for end case back in 2012. In 2013, uh, partnership with Simpson Garfinkel, then he was at the Naval Postgrad School at the time. Uh, we open sourced it and integrated it into Bulk Extractor. Um, LightGrep features standard grep syntax, not its own franken grep. Um, and so, and, and what really distinguishes LightGrep is its support for different encodings. So UTF-8, UTF-16, ASCII, EBDICT, everything, every encoding under the sun, uh, LightGrip can say, can look at a pattern and identify it in whichever uh, encodings you want to search for uh, in the raw binary data. So it doesn't try to decode the binary data. It look, it changes your keyword to recognize it in binary data. Um, and LightGrip powers a lot of the forensic processing at Strauss Freeberg. Uh, so we are pushing out a new release of LightGrip. Uh, Probably going to slip until tomorrow. Uh, I got to finish up some documentation changes on there. Um, but uh, uh, it will come with a new command line tool. Uh, we've had it for a long time. It still probably needs, um, you know, needs your, it really needs your feedback uh, for me to take it to the next level. But it'll allow you to search binary or, uh, or log data, text data. Uh, and we'll have a uh, Windows build available. So that instead of just like having a library for C developers, um, you'll be able to use LightGrep from the command line. Um, we're also changing the open source license on it. Uh, to date, uh, it's been under the GNU public license. Uh, and with this new release, we're switching the license over to the Apache 2 software license, which is far more friendly to other businesses. So hopefully we can get uh, uh, a greater adoption for LightGrep and see it in other tools and, and you know, get get more usage of it from, from lots of folks. Um, this release will also uh, feature uh, reduced memory usage on really complex uh, pattern sets. So you can check it out at our uh, Strauss Friedberg GitHub page. Um, the thing that distinguishes a multi-pattern search, uh, the algorithms get complex, but at the high level, it's really easy to understand. GREP is a fantastic tool. It's really fast, it's hard to beat. Um, but if you have 100 keywords, and you've got to search a terabyte of log files, you're going to have to research that log file 
a hundred times. LightGrep can take those hundred keywords, bundle them up together in a principled way, and take one pass through that uh, one terabyte file. Now it's not a hundred times faster, but it's still usually several times faster than doing a loop a hundred times over uh, uh, with grep. And so that's it's the thing that inspired this talk is uh, all the half game cases that we had to deal with um, uh, in March, where we had like tons of IIS and exchange logs, and we had a lot of uh, IOC search terms, IP addresses, and ASPX web shells, and we just needed to triage exchange logs as fast as we could to um, to figure out, you know, like was this exchange server uh, uh, hit with the web shell? Do we see anything that indicates that it was? And so this little GIF here shows us searching uh, 339 megabytes uh, of uh, IIS exchange log data for 67 uh, half name related uh, terms. And you can see it takes like four seconds or whatever. Okay, so we've talked about some core command line tools and how to compose them together to do stuff fast. Now we're going to talk about taking those principles and applying them uh, using cloud infrastructure and scaling up with AWS. So AWS, I think at this point, is in the hundreds of services that they offer and they add new stuff all the time, but we're going to talk about three very critical ones. Uh, the S3 simple storage service, I'm sure most people have heard of it. If not, it's, a, it's an object store. You can store stuff, whatever you want, as, a, as discrete objects, kind of like a file system, but it operates over HTTP, and it's cheap. If you want to store a whole bunch of log data or images or whatever in S3, it's super cheap, and you're, you can be relatively sure that they're not going to lose your data. Uh, the next one is AWS Lambda. It's their serverless compute platform, or in other words, you run functions. So each, you can think about each Lambda like a JavaScript function or a Python function or Rust or C++. You can run a whole bunch of different stuff, um, but it's really just at the end of the day, a function. And the nice thing about Lambda is you can pair it with other services like S3. So you can trigger um, Lambdas to run when other stuff happens in AWS, like uploading a file to S3. The last thing is the Cloud Development Kit, or CDK. If anyone's familiar with HashiCorp Terraform, it's kind of the same idea. It allows you to write code to describe what you want to build in AWS, and then it will deploy your infrastructure for you. Um, and that integrates with AWS CloudFormation. So if you remember the previous sketch that I made of showing like find to parallel to like lots of uh, uh, greps that are happening simultaneously. Um, that sketch kind of illustrated that a traditional computer has bottlenecks. We're bottlenecked on our input. AWS is essentially a new type of computer where we can put up lots of data into it, right? Near infinite amount of data uh, into S3, store it very cheaply, extremely reliably, and that data, Amazon takes care of striping that data across their entire data center, right? So you're utilizing lots and lots and lots of IO dev devices and lots and lots of storage servers. At the same time, then you can pair your lambdas with individual S3 objects to do your searches in parallel. So while GNU Parallel was great if you just have a single system and a hard drive uh, hooked up to it with you know, a couple of terabytes of logs, if you have dozens of terabytes of logs, thousands of files, AWS can scale to that without any bottlenecks. And that's really kind of like the revolutionary part of, of what makes AWS uh, a new type of computer. Okay, so I'm going to show an example of what using the AWS CDK looks like. Um, there's some tools that you have to have installed, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, we have a repo associated with this uh, talk, like I said before. One of the things inside of that repo is a template CDK application. So you don't have to do this from scratch. We've given a template uh, for you. And we have an example Lambda function written. It was just shown in this example. And all it really does is it prints out, hey, there's a new object in S3. So what we've done in the CDK app is we have an S3 bucket and then this Lambda, 
and we've hooked them up so that every time a new object gets uploaded to the bucket, you run the Lambda. And thinking about how you could use this, that's great. It, you could use it however you want, right? Every time uh, someone uploads a file, you could grep for keywords, you could process the data, do some data engineering, and then throw it in Elasticsearch. Um, although I would, I would encourage you to do some enrichment or more uh, analysis before just throwing stuff in a search tool. Um, you can do whatever you want, and it's up there in the repo for you. Uh, as you can see, it's really just as easy as writing CDK deploy. It deploys the stuff for you. So last, like I said, the repo link is, is right here. We have this template AWS CDK app and a bunch of documentation on how to install the tools to use it and deploy it, and then also how to change it so it's actually useful for you to process data. We have a shell scripts with all of the commands from the examples, and we have the uh, data sets that uh, we used in the examples. We also have a Docker file with, the, with a static build of Lightgrep in it, so you can play around with Lightgrep. We have all of the tools. I'm pretty sure I got all of them. Uh, in the Docker file. If I'm missing one, I'm happy to add it. Uh, so you can play around with all of these tools without having to install them yourself. Um, and then I'll, I also added some core data science libraries from Python and from R, if anyone are fans of those. All right. So I think we have a, uh, a few questions that have come in. Um, the first I will pose to uh, Noah here around the fly. He hasn't seen it, um, but that is, can one pipe Unix command output to CSV kit? So, because oftentimes the spacing of stuff like that uh, will will have problems. Yes, CSV kit. All of the tools in CSV kit are designed to read from standard in. So, if you use one Unix tool to uh, output some data, you can pipe it directly to the CSV kit tools, and they'll read them by default. You can also just read from a file with the CSV kit tools, but they're really designed with the Unix, um, Unix usage style in mind, but yes. Okay, and then two questions about Lightgrep. Uh, I'm gonna answer the second one first. Um, they mentioned if Lightgrep will parse the information and compress log files like Zgrep, the answer to that is no. Uh, Lightgrep just deals with the data as it is, searches the data as it is. Um, that's why the bulk extractor uh, integration is a great thing. I've been talking with Simpson Garfinkel about a bulk extractor 2.0, that's, that's kind of, coming later this year, I think, and uh, it's able to deal with the actual extraction and uh, present that data to bulk extract. Oh. I, I will say there are command line tools to solve those problems. So you don't necessarily need to write a new one. You can use gunzip or gunzip. If you use gunzip-c, it just pipes it to standard out and you can pipe it to lightgrep. You can use zcat is another easy one. So um, if you can pair other existing tools to handle those problems. So then the other one is, how does Lightgrip compare to Silver Searcher? Uh, that's a good question that I am not super able to answer right off the, off the cuff, but I'll do my best. Um, my understanding is Silver Searcher, it's a good search tool. Uh, it's designed for searching code repositories, and uh, I believe it indexes the data first. So it's creating a search index of, of data, usually based around text, and um, then can answer you know, queries very quickly based upon that search index. Uh, Lightgrep is not a index search tool. It is just a straightforward one byte at a time grep tool. It just can do multi-pattern grep and has support for lots of encodings. Um, so, so Lightgrep is really geared more towards doing um, uh, binary searching, searching of binary data. That's really like how it got its life was I need to go through unallocated space and find all the things all at once. Um, but we have found it useful for, for searching logs as well. Um, Silver Searcher, great tool though. That's a, that's a, a nice one to put in your, your uh, tool belt as well. Any other questions? How are we doing? That's it. Um, there's there's one in here about a, a comparison to Yara. I don't know if that's enough of a, a difference from a lot of what you just talked about speed -wise. Oh yeah, between Yara. Yeah, Yara. Got it. Yara? I mean, so Yara has like a ton of Yara has a ton of functionality. Uh, and I've looked real hard at what they're doing and you know, like, okay, should I just drop like up into Yara and stuff? And it's just it's not possible. I wish it were. Um, but uh, 
with all the other things that Yara is doing with parsing PE files and uh, the hashing and, and, and everything else is doing, it's its own thing. Um, but in terms of raw search performance, like uh, search term to search term, Lightgrep will, will beat Yara. Sure. Yeah, and you know, I, I'm, I kind of figured that's the, the direction that you would lean in that answer. And I think that goes really well with some of the commentary that we had in the Slack channel, which was, you know, using a tool to do two things versus the individual tool and then chaining it together with pipes and such. And there's a lot of benefit that you get out of either of those approaches. But I, I agree, like pick the tool that's best for the specific task you need instead of, you know, you're, you're not going to use Zeek to replace uh, your IDS. Like that's just not what it's designed for. And kind of like you said, with Yara versus Lightgrep, I think that's another good analogy there. Uh, yeah, so the, the link to the Docker file and re the repo in general, um, it's it's uh, it's in the slide deck. We can put it in. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah, we'll put it in Slack. We we'll put it in Slack too, and respond to uh, yeah. questions in Slack over the next couple of days. So please hit us up there for sure. Awesome. Well, last thing that I want to say before before uh, we go into lunch here is when these slides do become available in your portal accounts. Um, you, we didn't even get to what I think might be the hidden gold nugget in, uh, in your slide deck, which is your appendix. Holy cow. This is like, I, I've sneak peeked through there and you got a, a slide on each of the various tools that you talked about. Um, I am absolutely going to be pointing to that for a lot of reasons, because that is a fantastic collection of just the, what's the tool, what's it do and, and how do I make use of that? So uh, just a little bit of a preview for everybody when this does show up in your account, you are going to be uh, very, very pleased to go back to the slides that we didn't even you know, have a chance to see here. So thank you for putting all that information together. That, that was a necessity. We realized it would be a 90 minute talk if we, we covered each one of those. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, it's going to be a good reference for those that want it and uh, something that we'll refer back to for a long time, I think.